well, thank you very much, uh, Barbara. As was mentioned earlier, I think the previous speaker referred to Barbara as tenacious, which means don't mess with Barbara. Right? Uh, but we're particularly thankful to be here. Um, I guess maybe if we could have the lights down a little bit, I think I'd rather you look at the slides than me, frankly. But um, it's a real privilege to be here. Uh, very thankful for the opportunity uh, to share with you a little bit about um, multiple myeloma, of course, in particular. All right, Ooh, is this thing on? Um, so uh, just to chat with you a little bit about multiple myeloma, and, and I was trying to think about how I'd entitle my talk uh, for the 15 minutes that's given to me. And um, I've been on this bent, of course, that we are obviously moving this disease from incurable, ultimately we trust to curable. We're not quite there yet, but I think we can say we're at least at the intermediate step now where we've converted this disease from an incurable one to a chronic one. So I've entitled our talk today from incurable to chronic multiple myeloma in 2009. I'm just giving you a, a pretty picture here of the three different Mayo Clinic campuses. Uh, as uh, Barbara mentioned, I had come from Canada, so they'd give me the choice actually if I wanted to go to Rochester, Minnesota, also known as a frozen cornfield, or um, to Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm like one of these things is not like the other. Um, so uh, thankfully, uh, I think my wife was the trump card. She's like, we're not going to Minnesota. But for the record and for the audio recording, I love Rochester, Minnesota. It is the motherland. So um, some of you have heard me say that this is the, my, my triune, my three musketeers of discussion around this topic. And I'd just like to leave you really with three simple messages today about multiple myeloma. We are better understanding this disease. We have better treatments for this disease. And I can unequivocally say that we now have better survival in this disease. So if we think of those as the three cornerstones of what I'd like to spend the next few minutes talking to you about, I want to de demonstrate to you that we do have a better understanding of the disease, better treatments for it, and uh, thankfully, very thankfully, better survival with it. When it comes to a better understanding, um, we've just heard an excellent talk, a, a tremendous work that's going on at TGen, and I'm, I'm glad uh, very much so that we're here together today because, of course, of the collaborative efforts that we have. Uh, but it really covers the whole span of multiple myeloma. It's not just about finding uh, that great and wonderful drug. It's a whole spectrum. It's understanding how we diagnose this condition. So, of course, for example, it was discussed about the TRAF3 uh, gene mutation that we find in approximately you know, 15 or 20 percent of patients. That facilitates how we diagnose this condition because it's still an enigma in many cases. And we're probably going to come up, as I'm going to show you in just a moment, ultimately with the conclusion that myeloma is not a single disease. It's actually six, seven, or 12 different diseases. And if we can upfront make a better diagnosis, we ultimately can treat patients in a better way. So whether it's blood work or x-rays, some special lab testing, um, we, I would suggest now have been able to classify the disease into different categories. And I'll show you a little bit what I mean by this in a moment, into what we might call high risk or standard risk disease. Why is it that two people get the common cold and one of you gets a little sniffly, can still go to work, the person next to you is stuck in bed for three days? Same virus, but it seems to affect two different people in different ways. Well, similarly with myeloma, myeloma has different heads, as we've mentioned, it, it presents in different ways. And for some people, they have very slow growing disease, and we're thankful for that, that they can live a good quality and quantity of life. For other people, the disease is very aggressive. And trying to understand that up front is going to help us treat people in the long run. And then, uh, of course, this is completely underpinned by the research that we're doing, and we need obviously to continue to do more and more work like the work we've heard about today. But two areas that I would focus on, or at least try and give you a little sense of, is the pathways that we've heard about, that um, cancer is so inordinately complex. Barb mentioned from the start, cancer is cancer. And it's vastly different in different ways. Multiple myeloma is vastly different than lung cancer, vastly different than breast cancer. Although as we get down to the biology of it, we're starting to see greater connections and we're seeing a greater understanding of someone in a lab over there studying lung cancer and in our lab here in multiple myeloma, all of a sudden we start to see connections. And so it's not just a question of the actual tumor itself, it's all the underlying growth that's going on in that tumor, the messages that the body is not sending and should be sending and are sending that shouldn't be sending uh, back and forth to allow the growth of this particular tumor. And then what that allows, if you understand how the machine works, how the multiple myeloma machine works. If I say, okay, well, there's this lever here, and then there's this hook, this hook here, and this button here, then I can find a place to damage that machine, 
to stop it, to reverse it, to impair its activity. So you've got to understand your enemy before you can take down the enemy. And uh, one of the things that we're very grateful for is that we have a better understanding, at least, of our enemy than we've had before. And so as you know, diagnosing myeloma is complicated. It, it's, it's not like a lot of, uh, and I'm not making fun of our solid tumor colleagues, but you know, solid tumor, is a, it's a tumor. Uh, it's there, you find it, and you know it. Myeloma is a lot more complicated, uh, where we had combined blood tests and extra to imaging and all these complicated things to ultimately arrive at the diagnosis. We've already seen already that this is a disease uh, there's a part of a, a full spectrum of diseases whereby uh, we don't just think of multiple myeloma as one condition, but really as a spectrum. Where over here, where you and I have these good, normal, happy plasma cells, something happens along the way for people to develop that condition that was already mentioned to us today, <coughs> having a sermonical gamopathy of unknown significance. People can have asymptomatic, or the artist formerly known as smoldering, multiple myeloma, and all the way to having very aggressive myeloma. And what I've put in these just tiny little arrows, people have devoted their whole lives to one little tip of that arrow to understand what is happening that makes this disease so aggressive. So of course, when we make the diagnosis, most of it, I know there are many patients in the room, some of you are mine, uh, and family and friends and supporters, uh, that they're the typical things that when patients come in to see us, we have to do the basics, the, the blood work, the, what we call the CBC, where we look at, uh, as I say for my wine drinking patients, white, red, and rosé. Right, so we have the red cells, the white cells, and the rosé cells, the platelet cells. The, the chemistry, things like creatinine and calcium, which we know are altered in myeloma. Albumin and beta-2 microglobulin, other, other proteins in the blood that, in, that are influenced by the cancer. And then we take a, a bit of a step deeper where we can do the actual testing of proteins for myeloma. I don't have a lot of time, of course, to explain these. And most of you are familiar with them. I know we have a full session in just a few minutes on free light chains. Furthermore, we're, we're familiar, and some of you are unfortunately all too familiar with people coming in needles with you to your backside to get a bone marrow test, where we can actually find the cancer cells themselves and understand them. But now we've gone, I would suggest, a step further, where it's not enough to stop here anymore, but that we can actually look at the genes of the very cancer cells and look at how they behave to help us understand the disease a lot better. So here's what they look like under the microscope. Here's the protein as it looks like in a sort of a character form that you're going to see in just a moment. But going it a step deeper now is to look at the actual genes of those cells. Where we look at the chromosomes and say, are there more or less chromosomes than there should be in these cancer cells? Are there, are there bits and pieces that have broken off and joined together? Now some of the greatest work that's happened in cancer care in the last 20 years has been the discovery of abnormal genes in cancer. Some of you might be familiar with a fairly rare condition, but an important disease called chronic myelogenous leukemia. And this is really perhaps the first disease where we can say we discovered the gene that genuinely creates this cancer, something called the Philadelphia, Philadelphia chromosome, where one piece of one chromosome joins up with another piece of a chromosome. They get together, when they shouldn't get together, and um, they start making things that they shouldn't be making. And uh, that's unfortunately what allows the cancer cell to live forever. <coughs> so in the old days, and I'm not trying to be political by any stretcher, but in the old days, when, when we used to uh, treat this kind of leukemia, it was the, the sort of the, the we're going to find them, we're going to snuff them out, we're going to get them. You know, you sort of go in there with guns blazing, and, and you, you really quite harshly give the patient all sorts of chemotherapy, hoping that amidst all the